Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. And today we're going to start off talking about Arcospheres. And Arcospheres are one of the sort of the, the fairly late game puzzle type things in space exploration. And so if you don't want to if you don't want any of this to be spoiled for you, if you don't want to see how Mike has put together an Arcosphere uh, processing system, then you might want to skip forward to the uh, timestamp shown on the screen now because well, I'm going to be talking about it an awful lot and going into how it works. And so if you don't want to be if you don't want to find out about that, then you can just jump forward. If on the other hand you do want to find out more about Arcospheres and you would like to see how I did it in my previous run through, then hit the card up in the top corner there and that'll link you to a video I made a while back about how I did the Arcosphere processing, which is actually quite different to the way Mike has done it. Uh, so let's get on and have a look at what's going on here. This system is built around a central um, warehouse in the middle, which is holding a supply of all of the Arcospheres that have been collected and and then filter, turned into their the various different letter types. And there's, we've got the eight different types you can see over there on the right hand side. And the idea of this system is that it's trying to keep them reasonably balanced, so we've got about the same number of each one. Because Arcospheres aren't used up by virtually all of the recipes you use them in. They are just converted from one type to another. So you might, you might do a, a science pack that takes in three three gammas and outputs, two omegas and a, and a phi or something like that. Or alternatively, you might, it might take in a different combination and so on. So every, so every time you run these recipes, the Arcospheres get shuffled around into different forms. And that means that in order to make sure that all of your recipes can keep running, you need to do some of the conversion recipes. And the conversion recipes are ones like this, which will take in, for example, a lambda and a theta, and output an epsilon and a xi. And by running these in the, at the right time, in the right quantities, you can attempt to keep the system balanced. Now, this is supposed to get it, get it to a, a state where there is about, about the same number of each, where there is at least 10 of each. However, it seems to be being a little bit funny at the moment, in that it's, um, it's, 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 it's continuously running, even though it's supposed to hit a, uh, a stable state, but we'll have a look and try and work out what's gone, gone on there in a moment or two. So this system consists of a number of modules. Over here at the top, we've got a system that works out um, how it looks at the arcospheres and to see what we've got. So it'll take all of the all of the arcospheres and for each of those signals, it'll multiply it by a hundred. It will then add zero onto everything and then output it as an S, which gives us the total number. So S is for sum in this case. So we've got the the sum and then the t number of each arcosphere multiplied by a hundred. And if you divide one of those by the other, you can then get an output here, which will show you the percentage of each one that we have. So at the moment we have 106, 107 arcospheres available. So there's 18 gammas and so on and so on. If we look over here on the output of this, these numbers have then been converted into percentages. So as you can see, they're all fairly close because there's about 105. But the idea is that we now know, we now have a percentage number for each one of these. And the idea of this is that we can then track what percentage we have and try and make sure that we have at least 10% of each one of those. And so I guess this is why the system keeps running. Because if you look at the epsilons and the uh, lambdas at the end there, they keep dipping down to 9, which is probably why it's triggering. So we, it looks like we need a few more in there for this system to work properly. The next step down is a clock that tells the system to trigger every five seconds, because otherwise the system would be running absolutely flat out. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but it's a complete mess, which is why it's not running like that. And then down in the next section, this is the main brain of the system. As you can see over here, each of the gravimetrics facilities that's doing an Arcosphere um, shuffle recipe, what are they actually called? They, these foldings, yes, foldings, um, has got a number next to it. And so each of those is then is then corresponds to the numbers we've got set over here. So for example, the uh, the first one up here where we're turning, uh, where, where we want to um, analyze, where we want to create and potentially create more lambdas. Well, there are two recipes that output lambdas. There's one that takes in xi's and gammas, and there's one that takes in epsilons and omegas. Or, um, well, Mike has romanized the letters a bit over here to give us a quick reference because sometimes it's easier to say t than it is to say theta. But anyway, he's taking in. It's, he's got those two recipes, each of which will output a lambda and something else, and he's analysing to see which one there is more of the inputs for. So here we're adding together the number of xi's and the number of gammas and outputting that as a two because recipe number two takes in the gammas and the xi's. Fine. Then down here, we're doing the same thing with, with number eight. We're taking we're check, counting the epsilons and the omegas and outputting that as an eight because if we look down um, over here, this one takes in the epsilons and the omegas and then we'll output a lambda and a gamma. So yeah, that all sort of works reasonably nicely. Um, and then over here, these two combinators are checking which one is bigger and outputting the appropriate number. So if two is bigger than eight, it outputs a two. And then over here, we've got eight. If eight is greater than or equal to two, uh, just you've got the equals in there as well, just to make sure it always has an output, then it'll output the eight. So we'll always have a number coming out of here. At the moment, it's two because there are more there are more on this side than there are on this side. So, that, so if we want to make more lambdas, it's better to run re re recipe two than it is to run recipe eight. 
that's fed down this green signal over to here. But these two combinators on the side here decide whether this, this recipe should run at all. So we look to see if there's less than 10% lambdas, and if there is, then we output a one lambda signal, and that is then passed through here, and we'll output and we'll pass through the signals that are being fed in from along from over here, the two or the eight, out into the into the rest of the system. I don't know whether both of these are actually required. I don't. I, I, I imagine you could put this green cable into the back of here and have it pass through, but maybe, maybe there's a reason why Mike hasn't done that. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, these then get passed up to here, and when the clock pings, any recipes that are expect that we want to run will then be passed through over to here, and, uh, and they're passed into these filters. So over here, we're watching for gammas, and if there is a two on the signal that corresponds to the two coming out from down here, then it will trigger the uh, it trigger the inserter, and the inserter will then will be enabled. It will pass out one of the one of those uh, gammas. The gamma will then roll up here, go into the two where it'll be uh, folded, and then pass back out as the uh, with with the uh, the lab lambda that we we're hoping for. So the basic idea is down here, we monitor to see which of the recipes that produces a particular type of arcosphere is going to be the better one to run. That is the one that has more input, more of that one's input available. We then see if that one should be run and if so then we ping it out every five seconds to the inserters which will then pass the relevant arcospheres round they will be folded by one of these machines and then pass back into the warehouse and so that will tick over nicely as long as we, uh, um, and as long as you've got enough arcospheres in there that the, to keep the uh, the numbers reasonably happy then it should reach an equilibrium relatively quickly now that isn't actually happening because it turns out it's not it's not working quite well quite well enough however i did discover that if we come over here if we take out a, a stack of arcospheres from here and chuck them into the machine over here this is the one that then turns them from plain raw arcospheres into a, a random selection of the uh, of the greek lettered ones which then get passed through like this as you can see and once we chucked a few more in and we let this run for a moment we have now reached a point where we've actually achieved equilibrium. So that's with 125 arcospheres in, in the warehouse. So um, that, we seem to have been able to reach an equilibrium at this point. I guess the numbers have got slightly bigger that the rounding errors on the, uh, on, on the division over here has allowed everything to stay above 10%. So it is now working. We just need to have at least 125 arcospheres. So the, I guess the next stage, the next step is going to be for uh, Mike to head out and start gathering the arcospheres up, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll well well I shall report on that next week once he's done that and once he's built this up and, and, got, and got everything running reasonably well. There are a few other little things to touch on here. So you, you might have noticed that there are multiple belts leading out from the uh, from the arcosphere storage warehouse. There's one that comes down here, there's one that comes down here, one that runs up here and one that runs across here. And the idea behind this is that because there's, some, there's a certain amount of overlap between the different recipes done by the different um, Arcosphere folders, so for example, both number four and number five will take in thetas. So with the way the system is set up, you need to have two different belts leading out to the two different grab facilities to make sure that, for example, number five doesn't grab the theta intended for number four, preventing it from running. So the idea is that when number four is expected to run, we throw out a lambda and a theta onto the belt here using these two inserters. And then this is the only machine down here that will, that will pick up either lambdas or thetas. So it's the only one that will pick them up and then it will run. And we've got two, two inserters along here to make sure it definitely has time to pick them up. However, just in case something goes wrong, we then do have an overflow that goes back onto this belt here and allows any any unused arcospheres to flow back and go back into the into the chest at the top here. So that you won't you won't have anything jamming it up. But even if things go a little bit wrong, um, but in theory that should never happen. The second note is to see that all of these belts have readers on them. So every single piece here, we are reading the belt contents and we're holding it. And the idea of that is to make sure that because the belts take a certain amount of time to carry the arcospheres back to the warehouse in the middle, and this system runs every five seconds. You saw earlier when it was actually running, and if I take all the lambdas out, you'll, you'll see it running again in a moment. It will ping again and reload the, uh, the belts to send more stuff out to the machines before the previous set of arcospheres have necessarily returned. So we want to make sure that the ones on here are included in the count in the warehouse to make sure that the system here is as accurate as possible. Finally, there is an electric pole in here that carries the signals to show, as, as Mike put it, to show what the brain is thinking. And so on here you can see that it's planning to do um, numbers 6, 7 and 8 in the next run because it believes it is short of lambdas, psi's, epsilons and phi's. And these num and these and these symbols will change around fairly rapidly as the as it ro as it rotates through the various different recipes and as the, as the numbers of arcospheres change. So now you can see we've now got back to a point where we are we're still not quite at, we still haven't quite reached equilibrium. There's still a bit of a shortage of lambdas, but we've got a lot closer than we were. I stole all the lambdas and we've got back up to nine of them again already. There seems to be a bit of an excess of gamma, but um, never mind. It is it is certainly getting better. And I can throw it back into more confusion by putting these all these lambdas back in again. And you can see now we have a crazy number of lambdas, but this is because I'm going 
going in and poking it and breaking it rather than because there's an act actually any sort of problems with the system. And it now just needs to churn through it a little bit until it can bring the number of epsilons and the number of phi's up to, sort of to match everything else. I did mention, I did say that I would break the clock at some point. So if I come in here and instead of, set, instead of that being a th every 300 ticks, so five seconds, I set that to every three ticks, which is uh, 20 times a second, then you can see that the system just goes absolutely berserk. It passes out loads and loads of um, loads, loads and loads of arc spheres. They all flow through the overflow. It all comes back around here. The, the system is just a mess. But to be fair, that's because I went and broke it. That is not a design problem. <laughs> but it's an entertaining one to watch with everything, with, with everything actually absolutely running like an absolute lunatic over here. Let's put that back again. So as you probably noticed, this is all built in the blueprint editor at the moment. So this is this is a this is a design that uh, Mike has been putting together. It is definitely not um, well. It's, it's it's mostly finished, but it has not been put into the uh, into the into the real world yet. We're also and and Mike is also aware that he has only used the folding recipe so far. He has not used the inversion recipes. This is a thing he is aware of. The inversion recipes don't seem to have been needed just yet, um, but they're being saved in his pocket for something uh, something later and will presumably be added in at a future date. So yes, this is the uh, this is the Arcosphere sorting facility that we have at the moment. If you want to say anything about it in the comments, please be at least a little bit careful about spoilers because this is, as, as I said, one of the sort of the the puzzles in um, in space exploration, and when we're hoping that Mike is going to be able to work through it without too many spoilers. So yeah, spoiler tag anything, or if, if you want to talk about it, or uh, or just to talk about things in an oblique and cryptic way, and we'll uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. <laughs> And now returning to the real world. Well, there were a, a number of things happened out here as well. So let's have, let's have a bit of a look at look at look at look at what went on. So I went on a big expedition. As you'll remember from last week, I talked about how a couple of the uh, the spaceships had got stuck because I thought let's just turn it round, send it to do another trip round its route, and if, I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh, I completely forgot that there's not all that much uh, ion stream stored in the in, in the long range spaceships. So uh, they all ran, a couple of them ran out of fuel, and I had to do something about that. And that wasn't too bad. Bad. I ended up coming over here and um, grabbing a load of the ion stream canisters which are being made up here for the science pack so conveniently we had a big supply of them I was able to grab just grab 150 of them off the belt that was really really easy uh, so I did that and then I flew off in the long-range explorer ship to go and rescue them and when I got to them, it was a fair, re the rescue was a fairly simple process. Um, in space exploration, you can't actually put two ships next to each other if they're if they're both flying. You can land them next to each other if you can get them to a surface, but these were lost in deep space, and it would have taken many many hours, possibly even days, for any one of those to get to an actual surface where it could have docked when it, when it was travelling at sort of limp speed, which is about. Point one or something like that. However, you can you can um, you can I think it calls it docking with a, with a ship, which is where you fly your, sh your the ship you're on to the same location, and then as long as they're both stopped, you can then jump your character out from one and get into the other. So you appear sort of somewhere south of it. You can fly in on your jetpack and get into the ship and then start poking around and and and, and doing fixings and things like that. So I did that. I got on board one of the stranded ships, placed a large area of spaceship floor down next to it over here, and then put the uh, put a um, particle accelerator on it, linked it in with an underground pipe to come over to the uh, the tanks on here, and then fed a load of those um, those ion stream canisters into the into the uh, particle accelerator in order to empty it and pump them out into here. And that went exactly as you'd hope. It, it, it refilled the. I was able to refill the fuel tanks perfectly, perfectly happily. I, um, a stack of fifty is exactly the right number to fill these, more or less, to the brim. And then the ship was able to then carry on flying out to uh, Stardust, loading up, and then flying flying back again. That went really quite nicely. I then continued my trip. I came all the way out to Stardust and uh, landed here, where well, I'd noticed that down here we have we have our system that is producing the um, producing the crushed aquatite, putting it into the warehouses over here. However, it's only be able to produce it as we've discussed at a rate of one one belt. Um, well, one, a, a steady, one steady belt, which is 45 items per second, because we've got four belts coming in here when a tra when a train has come in and is able to unload, and then we've got these various mines over here. We've got the crushers over here that are pulverizing it. Every four pieces of naquitite turns into one piece of crushed naquitite and some by byproducts as well. So that means over here we have one belt coming through here, and over on Talos we're using it a lot faster than that. So I wanted this system to run a bit quicker. So that was easy enough. I thought, well, okay, we'll just put in another copy of it up here. Fine. So we've got a drop-off station, which is which is again going to be unloading the uh, the type, which is going to be crushed over here. We're bringing up we're uh, bringing up the iridium plates that are needed as part of the pulverization process that are taken in by these machines. There's a little bit of funny business going on here. We'll talk about that in a moment. Bringing up a supply of acid that can then be pumped into the into the train, so we can keep the mines happy, and then we're taking away the excess water and taking away all of the crushed aquatite down here, where it's then fed into the into the same warehouse down here to be passed up into these warehouses and then put into the spaceships when they arrive. Fine, that's all. That's all kind of basically okay. 
I seem to have had a bit of a problem here with the uh, with the iridium. I think this is. I, I'm hoping this is going to be a problem that will just sort of sort itself out because in theory we prioritise the iridium from this side, which, I mean, it's it's working down here, on the on these crushers. So I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work on these crushers up here. I think it's just thrown itself into a slightly odd position. I think once another train arrives here and we start unloading the Nequitite and these crushers start working, they'll pull in some more Iridium here. That'll pull the Iridium plates through from here and everything will then sort of start trickling through and start working nicely. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on it though and make sure that does actually happen, but I think it should be fine because it's okay on the other one. Uh, and then as I say, the, the, all, that, all the, process, all, all the uh, processed ore can then flow down here and be taken away. I do need to bring in more batteries. I've just noticed that's something I've forgotten. Um, but over here we have a system that is going to recharge the train batteries and then any dead ones can be dumped on the disposal belt here to be taken away back to uh, Norbit and reprocessed over there. So that's that's fine too. Um, this is going to work until one, until we run out of batteries on one of the trains. So far it seems to be okay. We've got more bat We've got some batteries up here. So those have obviously been ones that have been emptied out from trains, recharged and then passed back in again. But this isn't going to run forever because I forgot to put in the belt that comes up from down here to bring in the extra batteries from, from down here. Uh, but as I say, that's going to be a relatively easy fix once I come around to doing it. So, with two of these systems running, that means we're going to need a lot more Naquitite to be brought in in order to keep everything happy. And so, I thought, right, okay, that's that's not a problem. I'll set up some extra mines. So there is a there's a, a convenient patch over here where we've got a, a 4 million, a 7 million, um, a, another almost 8 million, and a 3.5 million over here. So there's a decent amount of Naquitite around that we should be able to pick up, and uh, with a bit, a bit more work on this train system, it, sh it should start working. We should be able to set up some mines over here, and my original plan was to set was to link the um, was to link these two patches together, and to link these two patches together, and have one station for each pair. Um, I'm now thinking actually it might be better just to have a separate station for each one, and just keep them completely separate. That way I don't need to run really long belts and pipes around to transport the acid and tra to transport the naquitite. I think it's probably better. It may well be better, even if it'll require a bit more railway line and a bit a little bit more infrastructure uh, to have separate stations for all of these, and then that means I can just have more trains running. There's a better chance that they're always of they're always being somewhere to put a train. Uh, however, unfortunately, while I was building this, I ran out of um, space rail because I, I hadn't realised quite how far it is out here. I think this is about a 4,000 pieces of rail distance to get the uh, to get the, get the trains to come out this far. So, um, yeah, I went back to Norbit in order to pick up some more of it. I have now also noticed that there is a very confused train over here. So this one appears to be trying to get out to one of the non-existent mines, and a train really shouldn't do that, because there's no way that a train in auto mode should try and path through non-existent rails, even if it's in, uh, especially, if, or even if they're in ghost mode. And so that, that confused me a bit, and then I looked at it a little bit further and went, hang on a minute, there's meant to be um, an extra two wagons of, uh, an extra two fluid wagons on the back of here, because these are supposed to be a one, an eight, and then three. Then I did a little bit more looking around, and all the way down here I discovered this little lost uh, fluid wagon that's just sitting there full of acid going, well I don't know. Um, so that's that's a bit concerning, and after a bit of thought, I'm pretty sure what happened here is that a train, dis train came in from this line over this way, and then decided it wanted to go north in order to get presumably up to this station. And rather than going round this nice, n nice tidy little corner here, which you know you, you'd think would be the obvious way to go, instead it decided it'd be fun to whip all the way around this roundabout and then come up through this way. And because these trains are quite long, I, I believe that means the um, the locomotive there ended up punching through the penultimate wagon over here, which is why we have one little lost wagon here. And then the other train was going really quickly because the space trains do, they go at hell of a speed. And so its momentum, when it flicked over to manual mode because it had had an accident, was enough to carry it all the way up this line here until it finally went bump into the non-existent rails at the top. And I believe that is why this locomotive at the front is slightly damaged. So that's a bit of a mystery. Uh, well, it's not so much a mystery as to what happened, because I'm pretty sure that is what happened. But what is a mystery is to the why. Why did that happen? Why did the train decide it'd be a good idea to go up here instead of going, you know, round the loop? And if we look at where this train's trying to go, that one is trying to go the, the correct way. It's trying to go trying to go where you'd expect it to. So I'm a little bit concerned about this, and I think the own and I'm not sure how I'm not really sure how to fix it, because it really shouldn't have happened. Um, and if I take it, but if I come in here and I, if I take out these inner pieces around here, then it's going to cause problems for some of the other trains. So we, we have, for example, we have train, we are going to have Naquim trains coming from up here, down here, which are going to want to come up here and then potentially turn right to go to this station. We're going to have them coming out of this station and wanting to turn right to go up to the mines up to up at the top. 
Ones for coming in from this, ones that are coming out of this station up here may well want to come round here and go round this way. So I think the only piece of rail here that isn't required might be this one. So I could remove that curve in there, and that will then prevent any trains from going whipping round here where for trying to, when they're trying to go north, which is, as I say, is a stupid thing for them to do anyway, and will mean that the only way they could possibly break is if one is coming down here and decides to go off this way. But that's still possible, because a train might come from the northern mines and want to go over to the stations over here. So perhaps a better fix would be to remove all of the internal corners here and then just put some turny roundy points in up here and maybe over here before this station so that there are still ways to, and means of, do it, of, of doing uh, right turns but it's just going to be a little bit longer and not cause a train to run into itself. I do notice that there are some spurious extra uh, signals in here. So these these um, these rail signals should not be here. It should just be chain signals inside the uh, inside the blueprint. However, the, these are here because I think the the when when I, I put the uh, junction in as an afterthought probably, and so it's overlapped. It's got too many signals in there. So removing removing some of these might also help. Um, I, but I'm not sure. It, I feel like it's a thing that shouldn't have happened in the first place because the train should path to take the short route like, like this one is trying to do. But it seems pretty clear to me that this train must have tried to go all the way around there. So it, 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 it's weird. I, I don't really understand what why this could have happened, but it has definitely happened. This train has got broken. I don't want that to happen, so I need to find some sort of fix for it. <laughs> The next thing to take a look at is some of the combat stuff that's been happening in the last episode. So last week I told you that Mark had been building up the uh, the anti-biter capsules, and these these are interesting things. If we look in, if we have a look in here, you can see the effect of these is described as that they will cull a portion of the biter population and damage the biter DNA and regress them to a less dangerous form. And that's quite interesting. So we'll grab a set of these, and then I'm going to head out due south because I believe that's where the nearest biters are. And if you'll join me out there in a moment, we'll have a play with these things and see what happens. Well, that was quite a long flight. Aren't you glad we have the magic of YouTube editing to uh, to save you from that sort of thing? So, down here we have a biter nest, a biter base with various spawners and biters and things in it. And so, if I if I fly over here a little bit, I can chuck one of these things in and then run away. And you'll notice that, that has absolutely wrecked my uh, frame rate. And also, I've taken damage from that, which has knocked me out of the sky. That's unfortunate. Uh, however, you'll see that purple cloud over there, which is having a bit of an effect on the biters. It is doing some poison damage to them. Um, I can't move because I've fallen in water, which was somewhat unwise. I'm now going to get wrecked by these biters, probably. Uh, yeah, or the spitters, rather. The biters can't get to me, but the spitters can. Um, but you'll notice that over here now, we don't really care what's happening to me. Uh, <laughs> we'll notice over the, that over here, we get, we've we got... Um, the, the, so the spitters are taking a fair amount of damage. Some of them are dying. We've also got various nests dying inside the base over here. Um, you can see that one, I think that one exploded. We may see, we may see some actually dying if we're, if we're lucky. Uh, and this is, so effectively, this, this, this purple cloud is not the area of effect. The reason we've dropped down to three and a half frames per second now, and that is really painful, is because this is now affecting the entire planet. So it takes the game a fair amount of effort to work out what's going on. And so you can see we've got over here, just in this nest, we've got quite a lot of dead spawners over here. Um, there's possibly some various dead biters, I can't see any. But the idea, the point is that this will now kill off the biters across quite a large amount of the planet. Sorry, it will kill off the biters all over the planet. Um, and in, in sort of relatively large numbers. And so having deployed a few of these, we've seen huge amounts of death, even in even in sort of distant parts of the planet, like way down here where we've never been. You can see there are, yeah, there you go, there's another nest dying, another spawner dying, there's another spawner dying over here. There's a worm dying down here. So having just chucked that at miles away, it's killing stuff all over the planet and doing massive amounts of destruction to the biters. So these are really, really powerful. And you might also notice that there are no behemoth biters in this in, in this whole place. So we've been playing for ages. We've had loads of behemoth biters around. But there's nothing here that's bigger and scarier than the blue guys. So we see, you, you can also see that we've seen a massive drop in the, in the da da dangerousness of the biters. As a further demonstration of this, I've managed to get myself a little bit further away from the, uh, from the uh, purple cloud that I left before. So if I run the evolution command, you can see we have currently have an evolution factor of 0.8949. If I chuck another one of these capsules out, we'll again get the horrible frame rate problems. I'll take a little bit of damage from it, all that sort of stuff. But we can now see that the evolution factor has dropped to 0.7. So that's taken off almost 0.2 of the, off the evolution factor. So this is doing a huge amount of, causing a huge amount of regression to the biters and turning them into much, much less dangerous ones. 
We did also wonder, because we aren't quite sure how this system is supposed to work, we wondered if this was going to be affecting other planets as well. So we had have had a look out on Anathema to see what's going on out here, and okay, we've still got the frame rate difficulties, uh, which is fair enough, because it's, it's still trying to work out what's going on over on Norvis. But over here, you can see that we do still have swarms and swarms of green biters. So it does appear to only affect one planet, which makes a lot of sense. Something that blows out a pollution cloud onto a single planet, it would be a bit weird if it did affect all of them. However, we're, we were a little bit surprised that the game engine supported that. And if I run the evolution, yeah, because if, if I run, oh, if I run the evolution command over here, you can see that we're, we're seeing a, um, we're seeing seeing a much higher evolution factor over here. So even though we've not killed anything on this planet, we still see a much a, a larger number. So yes, these 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 weapons have a huge effect on the on the local planet, but don't actually affect anywhere else. Actually, I might have to take back what I just said, because I've just run the evolution command again, and it's gone back up to 0.85. So it's lower than it was before I threw this before I threw that grenade out, but it's gone up a bit since it triggered. So I have to admit, I don't entirely understand how these work, but it does seem to have worked extremely effectively on Norvis at bringing the biters down to a much, much uh, less dangerous level. We do now only have blue ones. We've done massive slaughters of their uh, spawners across the planet. So this is enormously effective. We're going to have to think about what the best way to use this is going to be. I think most of the time it's not really going to matter because we do have the plague rockets which are quite good for killing off planets in general. But on Norvis we thought, well, we don't really want to plague Norvis. It feels wrong somehow. So we'll just, we'll just try other things like um, messing with the biter's DNA to, uh, to regress them a little bit. <laughs> And if we look at this one down here, you can see almost like when I look at the areas that have been lasered, you can see you can see on on the mini map, you can see the uh, all all the nests is disappearing because of the sheer number of them that have been killed off by uh, by throwing these capsules around. So it is a really really effective weapon. It has brought the biters back down to being much much more manageable. And thinking of ways to make the biters more manageable, well, you'll you'll notice that we have now scanned the entire planet. We've not I won't say we've explored it because there's lots of places we haven't been, but we've used the navigation satellite to run an entire a scan on the entire on the planet until it until the entire thing has been explored. Additionally, Tristan has been carrying on with the combat. <clears throat> so last time I told you he'd extended the, uh, the the defended area out into these into this radar column along here. Now he's extended it a little bit further, as you can see by, by all these sort of protrusions coming along here. And he's also put an additional three rows across the top here. So he's working working on he's well he's getting close to having dealt with an entire quarter of the planet because well he's getting he's getting fairly close to the top with these with the, with where the rows are going and these rows are getting almost all the way over to the edge. So. Yeah, I'd say that's going to cut off almost a quarter of the planet once he gets there. So yeah, that's good. That's going pretty well. We will have this planet pacified in maybe another four or five months. We shall see how long it actually takes. <laughs> We've also gone around making minor fixes around the inter around the universe as well. So, for example, I came in and I I fixed the underground pipes here that weren't go weren't going properly underneath the uh, the um, beacons along here and copied that all the way across to all all of these places because it's the same design all the way across. Copied and pasted all the same mistakes, and this happened because, as I've said before, these um, these particle accelerators stick out above their bounding box. You can see the yellow tags in the corners showing the edge of where the machine is, and so we've then got these pipes up here, but they get hidden behind the uh, the top ring part of the of the of the, uh, of the particle accelerator, uh, and that means it's sometimes hard to tell what's going on behind them. Also, sometimes it means I put things in the wrong place because I think that here is adjacent and here is the uh, is is the square above. Because if you look at these machines, for example, they're pretty much inside their bounding box. Yes, we've got this little tower sticking out of it over here, but basically the entire machine fits inside its box. These ones, not so much, and that is my excuse for why I keep making mistakes, and why not only did I make that one mistake here, it turns out I've made exactly the same mistake again here, where there is an underground pipe where there shouldn't be one, so I'm going to need to come through here and just set all of these underground space pipes to be normal pipes, and get that sorted out as well, because despite going in and trying to fix it, I didn't actually properly fix it, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll sort that out next time. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Over in deep space science, I chucked in an extra warehouse because, well, there was there was too much rare metal and too much lithium. Uh, it turns out part of the reason there was too much rare metal is because I messed up and forgot to hook up the limiter on the belt over here. So it was just always passing rare metals through as fast as it possibly could. And that was pretty quick. And so we ended up with rather more of it than we needed, which is why we have 25,000 in this warehouse and another 3,500 in this one. So that's a bit silly, but I have sorted that problem out now. We won't be getting crazy, crazy amounts of it brought up anymore. <laughs> um, I've also put in these limiters on the belts here to make sure that we don't completely fill the warehouse with one with one of the products and not the other, um, and, and preventing, it, preventing it from flowing through. Uh, the, the excess of rare metal isn't the end of the world because we do get through quite a lot of it down here making the ion stream but I still feel fairly silly for bringing up 28,000 uh, 28, of it when I actually only wanted to have 4,000 so you know it's a little bit over what I was aiming for. 
I learned that you can connect a cable, the cable network to duct exhaust, so this one is only running when there is less than 100,000 in, uh, in this tank up here. This means that there is always a sink for the heavy oil to be brought along here and cracked down into petroleum gas to be turned into chemical gel. Uh, we're getting through huge amounts of chemical gel. Uh, so we, we now know there will always be plenty of, plenty of space available over here, no matter how much is uh, cracked over here. We, we, won't, we won't just push it through out of, this, uh, out of the ducting into here and, and prevent it from working. This is slightly weird because it means this probably may not run, this, this won't actually get cut off until we have an excess before the pump however I don't think it really matters we may end up with a bit of an excess in here a bit of a stockpile but I don't think that's going to cause any problems we can just leave the pump running the normal thing to do would be to have this tank on the other side of both of the pumps and have this one and have this pump only run when this was at under 100,000 allowing these to always pump out and keep this tank at 100,000 this system is actually probably going to buffer less of it because I think this pump is going to still be able to push some of it out because when the machines down here use it up there's going to be sort of a higher priority as it were from this pump because if you see this 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 pipe here is not at 100% even with this duct running flat out. So I think we will always be able to run the pump over here and push it out of here. So I think we're going to end up with less buffer doing it this way than if I put a tank in down here and, run, and, and, uh, and controlled it from there. But, you know, it doesn't really matter either way. As long as we always have a decent amount of pressure from because the duct is pushing out into here and uh, all, this is, all this one is pushing out into there, and we, uh, but we also still have headroom to crack the heavy oil, I think it's going to be absolutely fine. For reasons that I'll talk about tomorrow, I ended up needing to bring heavy bearings in on the uh, onto the uh, space bus up here. And as I was doing that, I noticed that these warehouses down here were very, very full, to the point where stuff was actually starting to backlog up into this warehouse. Now, we've managed to fix that. As you can see, every, the, the, only, the only stuff in here is stuff that's supposed to be in there. And there is actually a little bit of space now at the bottom of this one. But I've been doing it, so I did a little bit of sort of, a bit of automated tidying. I noticed there were loads of red and yellow belts in here. And we're thinking, what's the point in those? We don't really use red and yellow belts anymore. Let's, let's, let's just get rid of all of those and get them upgraded. So over here in the disposal system, I've set up filters on this blue chest to act to, for it to ask for all of the red and yellow belt parts and pull them in over here and get them sent down to Norvis and uh, and upgraded and into into better belts from here. I did more or less the same thing with the with the blue so, blue flat solar panels as well. So over here we're making we're making the blue solar panels in order to turn them into the red solar panels because we can afford red ones and they are significantly better. Uh, however, uh, we had an enormous number of the blue ones stockpiled, probably from where they'd been upgraded to red ones and then not been pulled out into the system over here because we had a yellow chest here that was filtered to them but that was not enough um it was it we had we still had ended up with a load of them stockpiled elsewhere so i've turned that into a blue chest now that is requesting about 500 of these uh, of these solar panels and then that means it'll put them out onto the belt here it means these machines won't be able to exert their the solar panels they make onto the belt because it's going to be full and so we'll end up with then we'll end up using up these ones first and then making the red solar panels out of those so eventually that'll work through the backlog that we've got over there I do note that there is quite a lot of other miscellaneous stuff in here that we need that we're going to want to churn through. But all the scaffolding, I think, we'll probably use up in in, in expansions as we as we do them, and and um, and, and the rest of it. Maybe, maybe we'll gradually churn through it. I think it, sh it should be alright in the long run. There is an awful lot of space belt in here for some reason. It's a bit weird that that's ended up in here, but these are now green chests, whereas the ones it's put into when it's made are red chests up here. So the green, the stuff in the green chest should get used up first. So we should, we should find that that sorts itself out. Uh, we shall see in, in, in uh, as time passes. <laughs> Tristan has fixed the things we were I was talking about last week in the in the math that was causing problems with the matter science. So he's turned this pump round. So we're pulling the particle stream out from these machines to get it out to go out, over, out on, into the rest of the system for other machines to use it, rather than deliberately pulling it in in order for these machines to use it because these ones aren't needed anymore. Um, and we'll note and he's fixed the, uh, the whatever the pipes were along wherever it was that were causing some problems up here. I do note that, however, there is still a problem going on with the pipes here because these two have been put next to each other and so they've, they've, they've bled together and they've accidentally joined. So this needs to be removed and replaced with, I don't know, a three or a seven and a, some twos or what, what, whatever it needs to be, five maybe, replaced with some random bits and pieces of pipe to, to, to prevent those being sort of locked together. So we could remove that and replace it perhaps with a five and then a couple of ones at the end here to allow that to be joined up and then here we can look at these pipes and say well I want to ditch all of that thermofluid out of here and there we go now these machines are running again and hopefully that will allow it to catch up with the um, with the production required uh, we'll need these pipes to be put in of course for it to run forever but it'll but this is this is a good start 
On my way out to Stardust, I had a brief stop down here on Talos to uh, to, to, to fiddle with the um, the Naquium processing a little bit. So I've put in these long underground belts that I was talking about in the last stream. I've sorted out all the belts, and now we should have a decent... Once we actually get the ships working, we should get a decent flow of crushed Naquatite coming out here, going into all of these machines, and keeping everything running. That should be absolutely fine. Um, I messed around with the productivity modules over here and set a priority, so in theory we're going to use these machines by priority, because they've got the better productivity modules in them. These ones over here do need upgrading, so I need to just drop a module insert across them like that and that'll program them up with the ones we actually want them to have. Uh, unfortunately there's a bit of a shortage of productivity modules over here on this planet. Uh, I need to bring some more out. Maybe I'll do that on my way out to, uh, to um, Stardust on the ne my, my next fixing trip. I also noticed that there was a problem with the pyroflux being brought in over here. That turned out to be because I'd moved all of the uh, vulcanite from this warehouse into this warehouse. However, the belt that was taking it off to be turned into pyroflux was still coming out from leaving this warehouse. So I put in an extra belt over here that's bringing it over. And I noticed that means we've run out of the, um, the vulcanite completely. So I guess, well, I don't know how much pyroflux do we actually have. We have none in the pipes. Great. So I think we're going to need to make sure the ship comes over, probably increase the amount of um, vulcanite that we're requesting, and make sure that we bring this out in slightly larger quantities because this is uh, a little bit feeble and a little bit insufficient and it's all a little bit broken. Speaking of the spaceships, I should note that we've been having a few issues sending ships out to uh, Stardust because as you can see there is a massive shortage of sulphur. So we're bringing that in now. Some has been delivered but it's still trying to load this spaceship up. And we also have a bit, of, I was going to say we have a bit of a shortage of ion stream but that seems to have been sorted out now. We have um, we have some nice full pipes here so maybe that is actually being delivered quickly enough. So we'll see. We'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on these ships, make sure they start flying out at a reasonable rate. But I did notice that yes, there, well the, earlier when I was talking there were a couple of them st stuck here in, in, in waiting to go into Norbit. And now there's only now there only seems to be one there so things are getting better we can see stardust 2 is on its way out stardust 3 is also on its way out yeah, things are things are a little bit better, but we still need to keep an eye on that, make sure there's enough sulfur being made and so on. I think the extra construction I did out in, on Stardust has required a massive jump in the amount of sulfur required in particular in order to pull it, in order to make enough acid to fill that extra tank up. So that's probably why there's a bit of a hiccup in the system here. Um, but hopefully things will sort themselves out reasonably quickly and we'll get and, and everything will uh, fall into place. So, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the, uh, the video. There will be uh, the follow-up to this tomorrow, where I'll talk about the, the other half of everything that's been going on. So, there's, there's still quite a lot more to talk about. And then we'll be back on Monday for the next stream, when we shall be uh, carrying on, fixing all the problems I've been talking about today, and trying to expand, and, and just keep things running nicely. I'll also be back on Wednesday for another stream where I should be playing some more Satisfactory. I haven't done this week's stream yet, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be getting up to, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be further expansions to my new factory, which is which is fed by the train system and therefore is supposed to be a bit more future-proofed, a bit more and, and a bit less a bit less spaghetti, should we say. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I hope to see you in all of that. Uh, thanks for joining, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.